Hi folks, welcome to iWrite Radio's podcast and videocast um, Tuesday. We've, uh, I think we're all getting a bit bored with the pressers now. Um, it's not our fault. Well, um, she's having to answer the same question 17 times because apparently our journalists don't understand English, which is a bit of a problem. Anyway. I'm more worried that they still didn't understand what actually constitutes um, symptoms of COVID, <laughs> given, given just how long we've been talking about it and how, <laughs> how often it's been explained to them. But there we go. She, she did get a bit fed, fed up with one of the questioners. She scolded them about, do I have to tell you again? Um, <clears throat> well, we'll have a quick skim over that. Hugo Rifkin's got a piece in the Times. Um which references another couple of pieces in the Times, nothing like keeping it in-house. Aye, aye. Um, and we've got the ongoing inquiry <coughs> where Mr. Cole Hamilton has apparently jigsaw identified one of the complainants. I think what he, what he fully identified himself as was the kind of person that you never, ever, ever spend any time with. Can every organisation's got one? A wee brown nose shit stirrer. Yeah, okay, I'll go with that. Um, so, the presser. What stood out for you guys on the presser today? God, you have to ask the question like that. Mm. You know, just... Okay. Um, what was I... least boring on the presser it, today? It, it, it's all about face coverings, I suppose, and tests. And there, of course, there was the, the spike in demand for tests over the weekend. Uh, apparently, it was the UK government portal that collapsed. I won't go into the details of that, but it wasn't coping. The suggestion is, the explanation is, it's apparently kids going back to school, perhaps picking up calls, coming home, and their parents panicking. So there's been a bit of a run on the tests. I'd, I'd say anecdotally, that's probably spot on. Because then, I came up half right. a dozen people that have applied for a COVID test, but they're bearing it doesn't need a COVID test. So. But we, it did mean that we got some more detail about the current capacity and the current plans for future plans for the tests from the first minister which i suppose were quite interesting including um not just a drive-through test but a walk-through test uh which they're starting um starting the first one will be in st andrews for some reason or other well strictly speaking they've they've had a form of that already because they stopped gps giving the tests and they opened up local centers for you to go for a test now, they weren't drive-throughs, they were walk-ins. So to kind of save anybody going to the GP surgery from being um, exposed to possible COVID contamination, uh, there was one at the Western, I think. Aye, there were 50 all over the country, weren't there? Aye, aye. So I remember them mean, blowing their trumpet about them back in the day. What I did think was quite amusing was somebody tried to have a pop at them by saying, oh, people are with COVID are going to be walking the streets and whatever. Uh, why haven't you set them up sooner? And she went, because people with COVID will be walking the streets and stuff. So we needed to plan a way to make that less risky. Is that okay with you, pal? I mean, it should, it, I don't think they weren't behind with their planning for the autumn and their expected, you know, sniffles and colds and the confusion between ordinary respiratory problems and COVID. But it uh, meant that the First Minister sort of laid out her, what they're doing at the moment, which was, I suppose, was worthwhile finding out about. I do, I do think it's maybe one of the advantages of the same question being asked 42 times, is you get to hammer home your message when you answer them by saying, are you stupid? Mm. Well. She's also got three extra mobile units set up. Uh, 12 to 1,500 extra tests a day uh, and 11 local walkthrough ones. I should have got that number for you, uh, but the first one in St. Andrews. I, I, she, she suggested they wouldn't be just standard tests. I think, it, she, I think she mentioned the word surveillance as well, I think. Oh, she certainly had to explain to somebody that not every test done was um, somebody booking it. It was... These, the test numbers were part of the surveillance and the regular testing in care homes and frontline staff. I mean, I think a lot of people sit and think, oh, 40,000 tests a day. 
for Joe Public, but actually that's not what the 40,000 tests cover. They cover everything, right. which is worth... And we also discovered that the press seemed to think that the First Minister should be taking charge of discipline in schools for some reason or other, as if she's not got enough to do. Damn right. Of course she should. And she should be administrating most of these tests herself. I'm sending uh, the police in in uniform. And, and going around everybody's house handing out face masks to school children. Oh, yes, that was another thing. Discipline, not just in schools, apparently. Um, there was some journalist come up with evidence, anecdotal evidence, at this factory, chicken factory, that people were coming out of the, the, getting tested uh, in crowds and then going straight into the, the, which obviously meant that they were, should have gone straight into quarantine and going into the supermarket in bunches. And uh, this, this journalist wanted the, the company to penalise them by taking, stopping their pay. Well, this would be uh, the company that shut down now. Uh, no, it's just, no, it's just closed the factory. It's still paying them. This will be this will be Good the thing. This will be the cases that aren't accelerating in anything like the manner that they would be if it was as bad an outbreak as the press are hoping it's going to be. Because I, the number I, of new cases in Tayside today was what's eleven, twelve. Oh so right. It's no going through the roof in the way that the press are gagging for it to do so. Do you know what's come, come to me today? Given that we've had no deaths, official deaths, for, goodness me, is it five weeks now? Um, the press are going to turn around and say, well, why do we need all these restrictions? Nobody's done. Hmm. I think we should point out we have had deaths. We have had deaths. We have had deaths. We haven't so had tomorrow we'll find deaths. We, we, yeah, we get the weekly report. To the, yeah. The, so the, that, the, that they come out, that's people that die at home and in homes and stuff that that comes out through a different channel um so we we are not free of deaths no, that's true the other thing is of course the journalists are always trying to stir things up i've nearly said something an expletive but i'm going to try and be polite today um this one guy was suggesting that um in aberdeen the pubs are going to open tomorrow again and uh, but they're all supposed to have environmental health officers around to check that they're applying the new rules before they're allowed to open. This guy was saying, "Oh, there are loads of them have been told they can have an environmental test over the phone." Uh, well, what, are gonna, what are you going to do about that? Was also I don't, what, I don't the think about Aberdeen environmental health have been doing for the last three weeks when the pub have been shut. Have they been sitting with a thumb up their butt doing nothing like? Well, quite apart from anything else, I mean, what are you going to do? You phone up and you're going to say, have you done A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Do you have X, Y, and Z in place? You know, I mean, the most if you don't question, believe them, you go and check the premises. The most important question to be asked of any Aberdeen publican is, will we actually abide by the fucking rules this time? Mm -hmm. Because they didn't the last time. They had people queuing up at their bars and they had people queuing up outside their bars. That's why it spread and that's why they got shut. I can imagine there must be a lot of bitterness between the pubs that have really put in a lot of investment. An effort, uh, yeah. An effort into uh, applying the guidance and then uh, and get, finding that other pubs are just ignoring it and then yep. they've all been shut. They'll be raging. They must have been, wouldn't have been, probably punch-ups at the no, last no, the, or dinner. The, but one of them was slimy. The biggest, but one of the biggest pub groups in Aberdeen that, had masses of people queuing up inside and outside their pubs. They shut themselves before they got shut down and tried right. to blame everybody else. Clearly, they've got right. a decent PR man at the head of the group. Um, and the, the other question was the other perennial, what are the Scottish government going to do to give money to firms that are struggling? Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about that, mate. Scottish business today. Now, I actually seen, I was surprised they got a question because it's, um, it's not a publication, shall we say, that I know that much about. But I saw a post that they put out, Scottish Daily Business, that was it. Mm -hmm. they, they had a Facebook post today, and it was the most disgusting bit of begging I'd ever seen in my life. It was an events company. She's an events coordinator, and she was begging for government money. 
<coughs> begging for government support because she's toiling. Doll, you work in a service industry and you haven't provided a service for six months, you're bound to be toiling. That doesn't necessarily mean that the government has to dig into its funds to support you, to support a lifestyle that you're used to. Because that's what she was asking for, free money for the government. And she was aiming it specifically at the SNP. Mm, You'll forgive uh, me, but any free money that's been handed out came from London. Well, via, via the was, Scottish taxpayer. Well, the dying from the daily business was what in... Um, the two billion pounds it's apparently Aye, that was just idiocy. The capital Absolutely. in the Scottish National Investment Bank to, to be given to Aye. you know. Well just slurp that money up against the what he saved Tory voters Aye. who haven't managed to keep their businesses afloat because it's far more important to save Tory voters than it is to have a Scottish National Investment Bank. Um, lads, lads, now you know socialism is only for the market. Well, that's exactly what she, this wifey was asking for this morning, man. It's exactly what the boy for the daily business was wanting. Um, socialism for the wealthy to keep them. I mean, far be it from me to be disparaging, but wouldn't it be awful if they actually had to go and buy scones from the co-op like the rest of us instead of getting them hand-rolled on virgin's thighs by master bakers that they employ down the gatehouse? Sorry, that was master bakers. Yes, it was. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right, can I go on the Alex Cole Hamilton yet? Well, I've got, I've got a great idea. We can render down all the Tories and sell them for soap to cover the costs <laughs> of the Scottish government having to pay out money that they can't borrow um, to Tory firms that can't be bothered going and getting a job stacking shelves to keep themselves in food. I only see one possible fault with that scenario, Norman, in that you'll not sell much on the West Coast. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> everybody. Uh, I, I am an equal opportunities Bob Agme. I'll offend as many people as I possibly can. Um, the, the other thing that caught my eye today was... Hugo, my dad used to be a Scottish MP, Rifkin, um, writing in the Times. Uh, Hugh, Hugo Rifkin, Rifkin's quite amusing. I don't know if you've caught him. He's on occasionally as a guest on one of these radio political quiz funny shows. Um, and he is quite amusing. He's got a good sense of humour. But he occasionally lets his unionist mass slip and says something nice about the Scottish government. However, in today's article... Um, and he freely admits that he's a bit ignorant of Scottish politics. And because of his ignorance, he occasionally likes what Nicola Sturgeon does. And then goes on to say, when he goes up to Scotland, he gets put right by all his mates, who no doubt all drink in the same pubs as us in Leith and are all good working class laddies. I'd uh, imagine not. I'd imagine Hugo got that cut glass accent at one of Scotland's more expensive educational establishments, Norman. I know what school he went to, but I can't remember what it, which one it was. His daddy, of course, is Malky. Mm -hmm. Malky, who was the last Tory Secretary of State to, for Scotland in the days before we had devolved power. You mean the last power. real Secretary of State? We've had quite a few Tory Secretary of State since Malky. Aye, but they're, all, they're kind of only part-time viceroys. Aye, days. they're puppets. Uh, he was, uh, this was the days before thing, before the Labour Party came in, so he was the last Tory Secretary of State for Scotland who had he actually he looked after Scotland's interests rather than Scotland rather than the other way around. MP for the Pentlands, wasn't he? Um, yes. The point I was going to make, so having admitted that he knew nothing about it um, and that uh, he got all his information from his pals in Morningside in Edinburgh, no doubt, um, then listed everything that the unionist press accuses the SNP of having failures in, i.e. National Health Service, doing better than the English, uh, education, lots of people getting better outcomes than used to. What mm -hmm. was the other one? What's the other standard? Education, health, and... Anyway. Well, he, he did say that he, he was a bit swayed by the, the cultural argument for independence because of Brexit. You could see why Scots would want to 
retain some kind of normality. He's obviously a remainer, but he, he, he was he, he's positively terrified at the thought of the currency, the border issue and exports, if, if, if Scotland gets an independence. Well, but, uh, but, uh, exports to who? Yeah, there you go. Aye. If he's talking about exports to England, he already he's already admitting we should be independent because exports internally in the British market, as we all know, only count for Westminster. The border issue is a non-issue. The currency issue, I didn't engage with it, mate. I think their currency will be whatever we choose it to be on whatever day we choose it to be. So people will still want to buy our whiskey, they'll still want to buy our oil, and England will still need to purchase electricity every single day from Scotland. So they'll mm. pay us with whatever we ask them to pay us with. And shortly, once we get a decent melt of snow, England's going to be weirder than Scotland anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, man, it's worth me quoting his spinal little bit. He says here, it's been too easy these past few years as a remainder to despair of Britain itself and to indulge in the pious self-flagellatory -flag thrill of wondering why any nation with a choice would choose to stay part of the political basket case this country has become. Well, he, you know, he's still a potential swear. He, make, he, makes, he makes our case for us at that point. I mean, yeah. <laughs> potential yeah. basket case. What's he suggesting? How bad's it got to get before he just calls it a bloody basket case? Yes, yeah, so and how can he just, you know, attack the economy, potential Scottish independence economy and at the same time say that? Well, I, I've, I've had that discussion with a couple of them when they tell you just how bad our economy is going to be and I'm like, you tell me it's sparkling now. Aye. And they didn't, they didn't like answering things like that. Their, their answer that they never give is, ah, but we can borrow more money than you. Mm. Yeah, well, that's somewhere... That's their the, answer. Yeah, well, that fits I'm afraid, the, I'm afraid when, they're, when they've got a two trillion debt hanging around their neck, I don't want to be part of it. Well, I mean, I, I saw another thing on Twitter today. What is it? £8.6 billion pound being bet by Tory supporters on the shortening of the pound. Mm. 8.6 billion. And that's all dependent on a no-deal Brexit. Well, there is another report published this morning that, that suggests that sterling is no longer, uh, it's now in a category two now. It's no longer a, a category A uh, currency. It's and if we, of, a, of a, a, a third world currency. Well, and if Scotland gets its independence and 96% of the oil ceases to be in the clutches of the British, what do you think the pound's going to do then? Well, exactly. Forget about whether Scotland needs to, to, to do anything with the oil. If, if Britain loses the oil, the pound will collapse. Exactly. Oh, what a shame. I hear, however, Mr. Rifkin here does have a, you know, he, he, a little bit of levity here. He was talking about Mr. Galloway and Mr. Gove as the Blues Brothers. Apparently Galloway at one point <laughs> described Gordon Brown and Tony Blair as two cheeks of the same backside. I don't think he used the oh, word hold backside. It, hold it. Old I. When did we? When, when did you suddenly just slide into morning side there for the last? That, one that's a quote day. from Rifkin. I spotted that right away. <laughs> Scared to use the word "erse" in the title. Although, although never have the two cheeks gaped quite so far apart. Aye, that's a that's a fame. He, he really took it a bit a step too far I, with I, that one. I had to say the chuckle at that one. I'm surprised I'm sure that I got past the subedda. I'm sure yeah. Alec Massey and Hugo Rifkin drink together because there's, there's a kind of a... You know, they're pals. They're I'm pals sure on they're, Twitter anyway. Uh, I'm yeah. sure they are. Uh, they're, the kind, they're the kind of guys that you get thrown at a booth in the canny man's for when they walk in the door. <laughs> That's true. I've been thrown at the canny man, I'll have you know. I've been thrown out. I've been asked never to show my face there again. I do tend to go in any time on the morning side just to freak the guy out a bit because what's he going to do? About it? Does he still <laughs> does he still wear the tweed suit, the three piece tweed suit? Yeah, the last time I was in, he only had the two piece mate. He was wearing the he wasn't wearing the jacket. It was just the he's, uh, he's the, bit, waist, he's, the waistcoat and gaiters, so to speak. He's about the size of a, a large kid's doll. Mm. He's tiny. I I he's clearly been getting. He's stuff at his Slater's boys section, mate, for many, many years. Mm. Oh, well. Right. Um, I just wanted to point out just 
another um, increase, shall we say, in funding to unionist sites, because uh, both Scotland's Big Voice and End Devolution, End Scotland's Devolution Group, two Facebook pages that I follow assiduously to laugh at on Facebook, but uh, they've both produced videos in the last 24 hours, guys, that were astonishing. They were outstanding. They'd spent fortunes on them. You'd oh, think right. the Integrity Initiative had um, just signed a blank check for these groups at that point. I think, I think it's pretty obvious game on, at least from the union side. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wonder if they've gone too soon, actually. Well, I think it's panic, panic set in with these polls, mate. I think, as I, I, I say, I, I, believe there's, I believe there's some idiot in the SNP. Can, um, one that I believe is one of the parliamentary coterie, but I don't think he's quoted on anything because he's such a horse's butt. But he's been asking to see the Tory polling, the official government polling, because he wants to look at it. I'd love to see it, but frankly, you didn't actually... <laughs> Okay. As a representative of the SNP, you didn't come out and say something like that. That's just way too stupid, handing them way too big a stick to yeah. beat you with. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, today our, friend, our friend Peter Bell has had a quite a nice article today. But, you know, I read it. Remind me. Um, it's just reminding people that it doesn't matter how good the polls are, what's the plan? <laughs> Where's the action? Oh, he, he's doing his... The, Dirty British government will dirty trick you, dirty, dirty, Aye. dirty, mm -hmm. wasn't well, it? Well, it's hard to argue on the contrary, isn't it? You're going to say the British government are just going to lie back and think of England? No. I expect them to lie back and think of England because that's all they think about anyway. Yeah, but they're not going to lie back on it. Not in the case of uh, Scottish independence. I expect them to pull out all the stops. But I like, I, I, it's one of Peter's better pieces, shall we say. I'm not sure if he's I, back on Facebook yet, is he? He is, yeah, he is, he is yeah. for the moment. And um, he's still perturbed as to how, what went on last week, how it went on, how it was slightly different for other, um, for each and every one of the bloggers in that they got blocked for in slightly different ways and in slightly different for slightly different reasons, but now I think we're getting to conspiracy serious points where the old um, tinfoil bunnets will come in and folk will start asking if it was a dry run. There's nothing wrong with tinfoil bunnet. No, well, you don't move around in it too much. Well, um, if not, if not, you can wrap a tatty in it and chuck it in a fire. Eh? I bet everybody seems to have their the, the platform back. Uh, do you guys are you guys members of the hub? No, I didn't get why to get involved with that. Mate. It just its timing seemed a bit sniffy to me. Well, it's quite good actually, Jimmy, because it, what it does is it takes all the independent content that comes online and puts it in one place, or most of it. I don't think it's got it all. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, look it up. It's worth joining, and it's an easy yeah, way was. to go through the day's additions. <laughs> This is not the hub on the south side of Edinburgh. No, no, it's no. an online hub. It's an online, the hub dot Scott show. All right. Wait, yeah. Can I get to Alec Cole Hamilton yet? Oh, yeah. Aye. Please. Fill your boots, mate. Right. Wee ball bag that he is. As I say, there's one of them in every workplace, or if you've worked in a big office, the person who's permanently got that wee bit of totally hanging off their nose because they've had their nose in a place that you shouldn't go. But he actually came out at this parliamentary inquiry today and asked people to give him the scuttlebutt, the rumour mill, the water cooler conversations. That's what he thinks a parliamentary inquiry is there for. He actually he asked for that. Yeah. He asked for that in those specific terms. He asked yeah. for the office gossip and he was asking senior, senior civil servants. I mean, the two people that were there the day are in very, very high position. He was asking them when they'd heard the scuttlebutt and did they take any account of the scuttlebutt? In so the at, end, that in, point, at that point, he should be fired off the inquiry as far as I'm concerned. He's but in the, end, in the end, he got an answer from the civil servants, civil servant, which uh, was a yes. Which, uh, a I yes to what? He paid attention to the scuttlebutt. 
Yeah, but he didn't. No. It, civil servants didn't. Yeah, he said he admitted he'd heard something, but he was. He, uh, Cole Hamill never asked him what it was, to, so he never got right. any detail. There, there was a couple of interesting things this morning that struck me. Um, the whole thing stinks a bit. People know what I think about it. But for, I can't, what was her name? Nicola. Richards. Richards, yeah. She freely admitted that she'd told a potential complainer, somebody who'd discussed misgivings, but hadn't come forward and made an official complaint. She told that person that there were other people coming forward and that Judith McKinnon would be appointed the investigating officer if she made a formal complaint. I'm not so sure that that's and, acceptable. And I want to add up to that. And this potential complainer was forwarded a copy of the draft change in policy before it, it was agreed, before it was signed off for her opinion on the policy. But this is but they, did, but they didn't send it to people that have already complained in the past to say, oh, would this policy work? Because it didn't work in the past. Yeah. Yes, I know it. This this particular person. Evans had already admitted that. Yeah, but they only shared it with one, one other person. One. Yeah. And the guy who was behind the entire thing, he was kept in the dark about that. He never knew it had been shared with potential complainants until long after the complaints had gone in. That's it Hayden. Was, Hayden? It, yes, it was a bunch. It begins to look to me. And people have heard me rant about this before, but it begins to look to me like a group of highly intelligent but highly motivated feminists have used this whole procedure and the, the um, implementation of this procedure to get Alex Salmon. They are women who believe in radical feminism, they believe there was a problem, Mr. Salmond, and they have specifically targeted this at him. We also got to the point where Liz Lloyd was mentioned a few times this morning, and it looks specifically like Liz Lloyd was involved with the framing of this, but only in the capacity of protecting the First Minister's back. Aye, she I wanted would. there to be a separation of responsibilities. Yeah. But but that, that's what struck me. Aye, that, there, there I saw the bit where basically Nicola Sturgeon had made it obvious when it involved ministers, there was to be a cutout Aye, between well, the investigation and her. But you've got you had, you had two things that they were changing. There was a ministerial code for which the first minister was responsible responsible and the general civil service codes uh, policy changes that they were talking about and they were both both involved and because of that they were yes they were trying to protect or keep the first minister away from the well, the other one but the first minister chief of staff was involved in both and as if she's not going to tell her no she was involved in writing the policy what the point that was made was that Leslie Evans was the one to make the decisions where it involved whether to go ahead with a complaint where it involved a minister and the first minister wanted nothing to do with it. Well, the first minister had to, they both had, when they signed it off on the 20... No, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about signing off the actual policy. I'm talking about the part of the policy that gave the power to Leslie Evans to make the decision on whether to pursue a complaint under the policy, the first minister would obviously have to have input into the policy. Aye, we also found out that there's, from Mr. Hind, there's at least one document that has not been shared with the committee that ought to have been. Mm -hmm. now, I missed a point because I had a break in my feed, but he actually, I, I must go back and check on that, but he said you should have seen that document and I'm surprised you haven't. And then he agreed to forward it to the, the committee at oh, the end right. of his evidence. Um, but, you know, it was fascinating this morning, as I say, and none of us saw the whole 
session. I was about to suggest that maybe what we should do should return to this is look at the recording and split tomorrow's show between today's <laughs> witnesses um, for the inquiry and FMQs tomorrow at twenty past twelve. By the way, yes. So can we? Which is a bit odd because last week it was back to Thursday. I wish oh. they'd make up their mind. Well, uh, I know. I'm looking forward to Liz Lloyd's evidence. Stuff. I'm, I'm Liz Lloyd's not appearing. Liz Lloyd won't appear. She's already made it clear that she has no intention of appearing in front of this committee. I thought that was disputable. How is it disputable, mate? She's a private individual. They can't, they can't um, insist that she appears in front of a parliamentary committee. I know you think this is a court of law, Stuart, and I know it's been set up to look like a court of law, but it's a parliamentary inquiry. It's not a court of law. Hmm. The oh, county well, jailer for contempt well, of oh, an no, inquiry. Oh, oh, oh no, but she's she's going to get a very bad reputation just by well, not what do you call it, jigsaw evidence all round her, isn't she? Um, well, no, that's, she, she isn't. That's quite, she, at, the, at the end of the day, mate, that's part of her job to ensure that if oh. there is blame being passed about, she'll take the blame. She's not going. She's not going to resign. Nicola Sturgeon is not going to sack her. No, no, and no. If she gets, right. and, if, and if Liz Lloyd gets the blame, then Nicola Sturgeon, none of the mud sticks to Nicola. Uh, 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 and quite uh, apart from anything else, right now, if I'd been called as a witness to this, under the parameters of the inquiry as published, and I'd been watching it, I wouldn't go. Uh, that's fair. Because of Murdo and mm. Cole did, Hamilton. Did you yeah. see, yesterday I saw... I, I, I saw um, pictures, video of the very end of um, Leslie Evans' evidence from last week. Oh, we are tripping face, aren't we? Aye, and uh, I mean, you, if you recall, when she took the oath, she was incredibly nervous. She couldn't even repeat the oath in bits at the start. And that face that she had at the end of the, when she finished up giving her evidence, God, that woman was not a happy day for her. Well, Stuart, are you surprised? <laughs> She's a uh, civil servant. She is ringed with rules that she can't break. You know, they were asking her questions about her personal opinion, et cetera, et cetera. They're not entitled to do that. I'd right. have been bloody and fizzing. You're right about the inquiry, mate. You're, it's totally political. I'd also, I, there's you know, also I mean, some dodgy reporting. I mean, they've only had, we've had three um, witnesses so far. Um, Already I've seen people online saying, Bush, there you go. It was Nicola Sturgeon. Nicola was out to get Alex Salmond. This morning, Hind clearly stated that it was him that took the decision to include former ministers because it was filling a gap that he felt existed. So it was him that decided to, put, to make sure that former ministers were included in this because he felt that there was a gap between the civil service code the ministerial code that had to be filled. Um, and as I say, people online are going, it's Nicola, it's Nicola, it's all a witch hunt. So well, whatever people uh, say to this. No, I mean, I, mean, I haven't seen what the response. reported as well. I haven't seen the response online, but I, yeah, no, you're right, Jimmy. I saw that. He, was, he, took, he took responsibility for making that decision. I, th I thought he made a, a, given the strictures that he was working in, I thought he made a really credible witness. And um, he strikes me as somebody who, the Scottish government should be absolutely delighted to have working for them because he seemed bloody professional at doing what he'd done. And he, again, he's having to walk a tightrope there with what he can and can't say. And... But people don't realise this. I mean, they don't realise that the only questions that these guys can answer are questions pertaining to their minister. Mm -hmm. He can't turn around and say, oh, well, in John Smitty's opinion, it was. He can only talk about his job pertaining to the minister he works for with. You know, mm -hmm. if he works to the cabinet, he can talk about that. It, it's one of the problems here is everybody thinks it's another trial. It well, per particularly those that are sitting on the committee, mate. And they are know, desperate to find things out. They are desperate to and you and know then, what the report is going to be. Mm -hmm. Already know. You knew before the first witness sat down. As soon as was Hamilton a, and Murdo opened their mouths. 
I thought uh, Jackie Bailey was remarkably restrained today, I think, because she'd probably got in mind her future and her possible future as a, a temporary leader. Uh, mm -hmm. And she uh, she was remarkably restrained. I thought, oh, yeah, you're doing all right today, lass. I don't know. I think when, that, when, Nicola, when she got in a bit Nicola Richards, mate, she, I thought she ripped in. I thought she was quite... Um, she was trying to be a wee iron side there. She was trying to get her to say something. And then she cut off her answers two or three times. It was a bit... I thought it was a wee bit bullying. Well, I, I said that after last week. Jackie Bailey's the one to watch. Hmm. Jackie Bailey, she's put a lot of thought into this. Yeah, well, she's not. And she's laying a breadcrumb trail. Yeah. Each time she starts questioning the person, she's leading them to an answer she wants to hear. Yeah, a part of the process was a, re revealing is that I found this a problem last week when I looked at the all the written evidence that's on the inquiry website and the. Uh, civil servants are working from some from the footnotes, and mm -hmm. uh, politicians are working from uh, a different different coding. And uh, I found it a bit confusing last week trying to. Tie yeah, up that the seems that seems like it's almost deliberately designed to confuse people on Lucas Stewart, because like you say, it was a problem last week. So the fact is, it really shouldn't have been a problem this week. They should have been working from the same index at that point. But then, I, I, we've watched uh, trials, Scottish trials, haven't we? And when they've had the same problem. I, do you know, I think that what's going to happen here is Nicola and Alex are going to be reconciled over the dead bodies of certain civil servants. I'm not so sure, mate. I think at the end of the day, I think you're right. Regardless of what comes out, and given that you've got Murdo and Alec Cole Hamilton running about there like a couple of 13th century fools, then anything could have come out because they could say anything in that committee at any point. But I think what will be decided is that the civil servants put in process a code of conduct that is lawful, that is useful, but the first time it was used, because they were still putting it in place, there were gaps and there were problems that they didn't anticipate, hence the reason that Alex won a civil case. I think I, at the end of the day, I'm, everybody will come out smelling the roses. I'm sorry, Jimmy. Nothing will get done. If they didn't realise that the person put in charge of the inquiry had had previous contact with the complainants, they weren't paying attention. They knew, or they knew exactly what they were doing. That they knew exactly what they were doing, aye. But mate, they've got their defence in early. They got their defence in the day. We we are still in phase two of implementing this policy because of everything that's happened in phase one. We had complaints come forward. We had complainants come forward. Somebody leaked it to the Daily Record. We had a court case. So they're taking longer to tweak it than it took them to write it. Absolutely. They're taking <laughs> way longer to tweak it. They, they say now, they say to date, that they consider they have a decent policy in place and it is lawful. Pity that the Supreme, uh, sorry, that the, se the Court of Session ruled otherwise, but their argument for that is, yeah, that was just this one case. Just and the, it came upon us before we had really got the, every... This, the code of practice absolutely bang on. But it's also a bit unfortunate that even after the time that's passed from 2017 when the Cabinet Office in London said they weren't very sure that this uh, there should go back for former ministers, that it should apply to them, that uh, none of the other, neither Wales, Northern Ireland or London have also have applied the same policy. Nobody in their right mind if this is to be signed off by ministers, we, we must have some sort of incredibly clean first minister. No, there is not a prime minister or first minister of any other nation would have signed off this on retrospective complaints. Uh, can you imagine what the bloodbath there would be in London? Well, this apart from signed off for Westminster. Aye. Can you imagine... 
there's, <laughs> there's, there's that much. Um, God, what's that? I can't even use that phrase. There's that much that's been swept under the carpet in London that you can't even walk across said carpet. It's like walking across the moon. So there's no danger they're going to lift up the carpet and have a butcher's hook under it. There's, I mean, the civil servant that okayed this, if he could, if he had the power to okay it, would be in his job about three and a half seconds. Mm-hmm. There's absolutely, and Northern Ireland. <laughs> Did he? No, no, Can no. Can you no. imagine? No, I'm sorry. There is no way any other part of the UK will ever take a retrospective against ministers, not even civil ministers. Mm-hmm. Oh, Jesus. You'd have half the Tory party in jail. You would You'd have, have half the Lords in jail. You wouldn't have a Tory party. There'd just be Harvey Proctor standing there on his own because he's been proved to be innocent that one time. and He'd be the only one that would be able to wear a Tory rosette. I just, I, that, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to think who wouldn't be in jail because that's a shorter list. Ah, you're probably right, mate. Oh. Save a fortune on expenses, though. What? <laughs> and, do, and let's be honest, do we really need, do we really need ludicrously squeaky clean politicians? We've been trying to have squeaky clean politicians for the entirety, the entirety of the last century and then certainly the entirety of this one. Just, we just, and I'm sorry, but it doesn't work. Just to keep the unionists happy, as long as our Scottish politicians are a wee bit cleaner than their politicians, I'm happy. <laughs> hmm. oh, anyway, I think we'll call it a day at that, boys, because we're running on a bit. Um, I think we should all have another look at the, uh, the Q&A session for the inquiry. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe get into the meat of it a bit more. What else have we got coming up this week? Well, we'd we'd appear to, the First Minister seems to have forgotten about her going down to three press briefings a week. That seems to have gone overboard. No, I think she's she's desperately keen, judging by the look on her face when she actually has to come out and give the briefings. Well, I I agree with you there as well, but there's no evidence (laughs) of it. We're back, we'll we'll have have had three by tomorrow, and that's only Wednesday. (laughs) Well, as I say, time's running on a bit, guys. So, right. Thanks, Jimmy Hutton, Stuart Lockhead. Cheerio. I'm Norris Stewart. Thanks for listening, folks, and we'll catch up with you again tomorrow. Cheers for now. Mm.